She has written extensively on urban design and architecture, and currently serves on many uh, on editorial boards of many journals, such as Log, The Plan, and Threshold. Dean Whiting received her Bachelor of Arts from Yale, a Master of Architecture from Princeton, and her PhD in History and Theory of Architecture from MIT. Next, our moderator tonight, Kun Koshakar Mora Akom. She graduated from Guillermo Gons Faculty of Architecture and earned her Master's in Landscape Architecture from GSD in 2006. She is the landscape architect behind the multiple award-winning Jilalo Gong Centenary Park project, which provides uh, downtown Bangkok with a much-needed green space that also helps mitigate risk of flooding due to climate change. Kun Kosha is featured in the 2019 Time 100 Next, a list from Time magazine that spotlights 100 rising stars shaping the future of the world. She is also on Time magazine's list of 15 women fighting against climate change. She is a chairwoman of the Landscape Without Border of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, Asia Pacific Region. She is also a TED Fellow and an Echoing Green Climate Fellow. Our next guest, Kurmishai Tantarati Wood, is one of the pioneers uh, in the field of urban design in Thailand. He graduated from Jalong Khan University, uh, Faculty of Architecture, in 1970, and the GSD at Harvard uh, in 1973 with a Master's of Architecture in Urban Design. He also attended the Advanced Mention Program at HBS in 1997. Mr. Vishai is the former president of the Thai Urban Designers Association and is currently an advisor. He is also the former president of the Harvard Club of Thailand. And last but not least, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Thropong Le Siti Chai of Atambin. He received his doctorate and master degrees in the area of computer aided design uh, from Harvard and is currently the director of the INDA International a program in design and architecture here at Jalong Khan University. His research interests and professional expertise lies in CAD software development, novel roomware systems, computer games, animation, and interactive uh, software for digital entertainment. Before entering academia, Dr. Surupong worked at Fuji Xerox Power Auto Laboratory in California as a research scientist for two years, uh, developing intelligent software and solutions for business workplaces. He returned to Thailand to hold a full-time faculty position and consequently an advisory position at the Digital Media and Technology at the Software Industry Promotion Agency, known as SIPA. And let's get right to the first segment of tonight. So Dean Whiting and Makush Khan, please. Disruption and starting from your disruption 
at the GSD. You are the first female dean ever. <laughs> I think this is a great context for addressing this question because obviously you all had it figured out earlier than we did, so you have a, a strong female dean, and I'm very happy to see that. Um, and you yourself, Katja, an incredible example of female strength. Um, I have had the good fortune of, of working with Kim Khan, who is an extraordinary female um, role model. And so I think that maybe the question is less surprising in this context here than it may be at the GSD, where it's true, it, it took a little while for them to catch up um, and realize that maybe having a female dean wasn't such a bad thing. Um, so for me, given that I was, I was dean before at another institution, also the first time a female there, uh, I had, was somewhat used to the surprise maybe was mostly for some of our older alumni. Um, for me, the fact that I'm a female is not so much of a surprise to me. Um, I'm kind of used to it by now. Um, and I think that really our society, while I'm very aware, is, is uh, not equal for uh, men and women. I think we're in a moment of real change and recognition of the importance of having individuals in roles as opposed to types in roles. Yes, uh, thank you for being our leader <laughs> at GSD. And before you become a dean at GSD, you were a dean at Rice University, which is a um, single department of architecture. But at GSD, we are multidisciplinary. So what is your challenge to this change? And what have you bought from Rice University to Harvard? So that is the biggest, the biggest change. So Rice, for anyone who doesn't know it, is a very small university, an excellent university based in Houston. And the school there had an undergraduate program and graduate program, but a total of about 180 students. Total. So I knew them all. And so the value there of the small size is that you were able to say, okay, a, a design education or an architectural education there is one that uh, I think is extraordinary because it's so synthetic, it's so interdisciplinary. And the value of having a program where it's small enough that you can know each student is that you can say, okay, everyone gets this base, and then you can help direct every individual in his or her path. And so there's a real value to it being small, and you can also ensure that no one can hide. It's small enough that, that you can really be sure that everyone's getting the education that's best for that person. So it was a big shock, I will say, coming back to the GSD, because I had been there 15 years ago. It's now bigger than it was 15 years ago, and it's certainly too big for me to know every student by name. There are almost a thousand students in the school at this point. It's 950 or so. And so, that's, a, that's an enormous challenge. I think the, the great surprise or the great benefit of, of coming to the GSD is the fact that you have the three departments and multiple programs. And so you can expand, you can really take advantage of the fact that design is so interdisciplinary. And you also have the strength of the university beyond and of course of the relationships that Harvard gives. The challenge is how do you ensure that each one of these students gets the right education? And so since that can't be done individually like it could be Ted Rice, the, the um, challenge for me has been really working with the chairs and the faculty to try and help start to think about how the curriculum, we can really be sure that the curriculum is working to enable each student to gain that breadth that they're supposed to gain in every program while figuring out his or her path. And so that, that's the greatest challenge, I think, that we face. Yeah, and I really like the way you put individuality as the key, because as a design, education is all about that. And I think that's very, like, tailor-made to each person. Thank you for that. And I know that one of your expertise is in housing. And I just 
too that when I think about GSD architecture, it's about this fancy single, singular big architecture, cool high rise. What what can you t um, teach the young generation to really focus on housing and why it's so important to have that in that education? No, it's true. So I've I've made it clear. Um, already that two topics that interest me greatly, and we'll talk about the second one later, the second one being climate change, but one of the first ones is, is housing. And part of that is that, um, let's face it, most of our graduates will end up living in a major city. And if you look across the globe today, the, the um, challenges of housing are really acute across the, across the globe in our major cities. And it's a moment for rethinking models of housing because populations are changing in terms of how they live together. Uh, they were, were less close to our nuclear families. Nuclear families don't really exist necessarily in that same format anymore. And so it's a, it's a real issue. It's also an issue of uh, who supports new models in housing. If, if housing tends to be primarily developer driven, how is it that we can ensure that the changed individuality that I think does mark our contemporary society is being reflected in those models where I would argue that often developers will rely on tested true models as opposed to innovative models. And so I think that the, the generation of students who are the ones who are really facing the housing crisis in every major city are the best people to be rethinking how housing can be engaged. So I think, I, I think that's an example of a, a topic that we have to take on, that really is an important one. But I also want to go back to the first part of how you phrased the question, because I think it's true that we have this assumption that the GSD students want to do the next you know, Guggenheim, Bangkok, um, uh, or any other. And of course, it's true that a, a museum building, a singular building, is always something that's really quite um, important certain ways, but I think that our students today are interested in, in more complex issues, and they're interested in uh, social issues, they're interested in how design can affect the city, and even if they're interested in doing, say, Guggenheim, Bangkok, I'm not, that's not real, you understand, right? Uh, but even if, if they, anyone would love a commission like that, I think that today our students are interested in a project like that, how it would actually insert itself into the fabric of the city without turning its back on the city. And so I think that, that really what's quite interesting is that we're approaching, we, I think the students today are, are completely different than they were even the 15 years ago when I was at the GSD last, or when I was a student a while ago. And, and so I think, I, I would argue there's a kind of, it's a moment of engaged autonomy, of understanding buildings as being at once singular buildings and important for their construction, but engaged within a context that is urban, that is landscape, that is climate, that is economic, that is political, that is technological. I really like how you frame it as whatever architecture is going to close the social equity, the gap will be narrow. Society. Yes. And can we jump into this climate disruption since I'm um, like really the issue that close to my heart and actually Thailand now are facing the most drought season in our 50 years time. And if you open the news about Mekong River, it's no more water at all, no more sediments. And I think this is the big issue that how can we as a designer, education, can really put on this topic? So, I, I'm here not just myself, but I'm here with uh, two of my, my colleagues from the faculty. So, um, Professor Neil Kirkwood, who's the academic dean of the school right now, but is also a professor of landscape and technology, and Professor Ali Mankawi, who's a professor of Techn architectural technology. Um, Ali it runs the Center for Green Buildings and, and Cities. At the school, so it's a research center precisely into uh, issues of, of climate change and how it directly affects technology and, and um, actual buildings. Right? And Neil's work for years has been looking at issues of uh, 
large-scale remediation, how landscape operates as a force within uh, changing the environment and engaging the environment. And so uh, I actually think we have a, an enormous attention to issues of climate and landscape in the school. Neil will be leading a studio here with you um, this semester, uh, um, uh, looking at the, the floodplain, the lower floodplain, but not looking at how do you solve flooding, but really looking at how do you work with the water uh, yes. today. And I think, so I think that one thing that's very interesting, it's a very interesting moment for dealing with topics like climate change. It's no longer seen as, okay, here's a problem, let's find a solution. Uh, but it's really saying it's a very complex issue. It's a, again a synthetic issue that is, uh, you know, when the, the fires in Australia are actually affecting the air now in Los Angeles, that's it's uh, climate change issues are synthetic. They're huge, and we need to figure out how to work in a world that has these issues at their core. And so, whether we work in the world by um, learning how to sense these these systems and uh, if you look at, at the Center for Green Buildings and, and Cities that, that Ali runs, it's remarkable how you can start to uh, collect the information and try and figure out how do we live better with these, these systems through the information that we can use. Um, and so I think that it's, it's an issue, I would argue, it, it, maybe to use a natural metaphor, it's an issue that kind of flows through the school it's maybe not as manifest as it should be. So in fact, our students are constantly saying, oh, we need more courses on climate change. And I look and I think, we actually have a lot of courses or topics on climate change throughout the curriculum. I do think that we have to recognize that we have to make it a little more overt in terms of how it is affecting. And so I, I think that we're addressing it in some interesting ways. We need to make that a little more clear. Yeah, so I really like to tendency that is going to be become more and more yeah, concerned. Yeah, so actually I would like to come back to the teaching way of, of GSD a little bit and with the new generation of designer or us who really attach to the screen and you know like all this learning of architectural design is actually swipe out of this Pinterest and many other pictures image and and also some of the learning is actually online and I'm wondering, is that the real direction of how the design education should be? Yeah, I think that's, so yeah, think about all of you. How many opinions do you, uh, do you accumulate on architecture just based on a, one little image on your telephone, right? And so I think one of the big challenges we have today is teaching students how to develop opinions in our field in design uh, that are based on more than an image that's this big that they, they look at for three seconds on a screen on their telephone. And so really, uh, it's, a, it's a huge challenge for how to develop what I call an architectural judgment, right? How do you develop opinions? Because if we expect our students to go off and, and lead discussions of design in the future, they need to know how to develop their own sensibilities about what it is. It can't be a thumbs up, thumbs down. We need to teach them nuance and opinions. And so um, that really comes through conversation and it comes through careful looking. And so I think those are the two strategies, pedagogical strategies that are really important to a contemporary design education. And that includes looking in real life. And so the fact that uh, Neil Studio will come here, Neil Conscious Studio will come here for uh, 10 days in a month, means that they will really look at the context. Uh, they, they won't be experiencing Bangkok through their phones. So they'll be experiencing Bangkok really through walking through uh, the landscape, through experiencing the landscape, being on the river, uh, and, and I think that that's really the only way for them to develop it. The fact that it, we also have small studios, as you do, I think, as well. So eight to ten expertise to address any question that you're, you're looking at in a studio. And so you have to take advantage of the person on your right, the person on your left, the person who has two trays down from you, the person who's in another studio, maybe the librarian. That seems 
so foreign. Um, but really sort of taking advantage of the fact that you have to foster your knowledge through conversation and through paying careful attention, um, through going to lectures, listening to a speaker and developing your own opinions about that person's work. So it's, it's a little bit fundamental as a pedagogical approach. I would argue it's, it's really the basis of what we would call a seminar. It's close reading and a small group discussion. Uh, but I think that even that can scale up to the scale of the GST. Yes, I'm really relieved to hear that from you because I just feel that the human touch in the education is become less and less. So I'm very happy. <laughs> yes, and actually the final question is a little tough uh, as I cannot stop <laughs> mentioning about um, the well-known and star architect, Professor Ron Witt, who co-found the BUW Architecture with you, who also a professor at GSD, and who also your husband. <laughs> How do you balance that professional and personal relationship at the same time and become a dean? Yes. 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 So we, we work together. He does, he does not report to me. Uh, <laughs> That is, that is not allowed by the university, uh, but it's true, we practice together, uh, we both teach, we've taught together in five different schools, and yes, we do sleep together. Um, we also eat together, and we, and we take care of two unruly parents. Um, I, I mean, again, I think it's, it's a little bit similar to the gender question in that it's something that has become naturalized. Uh, we have two very different backgrounds. He has a professional degree in architecture, and then we met in graduate school. So I came to architecture from the humanities, and he came to architecture from a professional program. And so we, uh, we complement each other quite well in terms of our practice. Um, uh, he also comes from a family of engineers. I come from a family of humanists. And so we have very interesting discussions about projects. Um, I am admittedly less adept when it comes to structural and technical um, issues, but sometimes that naivete can actually lead to some interesting solutions. And he, uh, as he says, likes to consider history as if he's in an all-terrain vehicle. He's a little bit roughshod, whereas I worry about footnotes. And again, his naivete or his looseness can sometimes help uh, introduce perspectives that I wouldn't normally pick up. And so the, the fact that we, we come at the, the questions differently uh, really helps. Uh, we don't always agree on things. I don't always win. <laughs> uh, but I did have good training because I have a twin brother who's a prosecutor. So I, I've grown up learning how to argue. We, I, I have to say, we, we have a, a good um, uh, setup in terms of, of working together, um, and it's, it's helpful to have someone else who really is that close to you. I'll, I'll, um, so, a little personal story. So, when, when my twin brother and I were in high school and starting to go to parties, my father pulled us aside and said, Okay, I have two bits of advice for you. One, don't mix drinks at parties. It's actually very good advice for a kid. Stick to, they knew we would have drinks, uh, and so don't, don't mix different, it's very smart, right? And the other was find someone in your life to be with who understands your work. Um, and both my parents were uh, professors of, of literature and, and talked a lot about their work, and I think that was very important to him. I think maybe I took that advice a little too closely, <laughs> but I've benefited from it. Yes, I like the way you explain the yin yang of human wrong. Yes. <laughs> so actually, it's not last, but I actually have another one that many of my, my students actually asked me to kind of pass it to you because we actually believe that design profession is global, but actually with the economics and political challenges in the U.S. and of course around the world. How would you ensure that this education is accessible for all the students who come from no matter country they are, who they are, what gender they are? How could that possible with, with Harvard, which is so hetero, 
society? I think that's a really good question. It's, um, I mean, I think that's a question that all schools are, are facing, that the, the canons are expanding, um, the, the topics that our students are interested in are expanding, and our audience of students is expanding. The GSD is 55% international students. It's a huge percentage. Uh, and it's super exciting. It's a, a percentage of there's students who are from all over the world. Literally, all, I think it's something like 65 countries that are represented. Um, it is a uh, remarkable uh, hallmark of our education because if you think about it, really any designer is going to practice in an international context. We, we operate in an internationalized world. And so I think it's incredibly important to recognize that with our student body and to recognize that with our curriculum. At the same time, there are only so many weeks in a semester, there are only so many years in a curriculum, and so how do you introduce new topics, new perspectives, uh, while also making sure that they get the sort of foundation that they're supposed to get that is something that we share globally? Uh, how, how can you ensure that they get a foundation that is shared at all within the school? So some schools, for example, have taken this issue on by saying, okay, uh, we'll have three different sections of history. You can choose to take which one you want. One will be global, one will be Western, one will be Eastern. That seems a little problematic as a solution, though I understand why they do it. And so I think that the challenge of figuring out how the curriculum can work with a body of students that's diverse is important. I think the other aspect of what you're asking is also the question of accessibility of the, the education. It's hard to get in. We're not going to change that. We have so many students who want to get in. And so there is, it's a, it is and it will remain quite competitive to get in. It's financially difficult to come to the school. It's, it's an expensive place. Um, I myself paid off my student loans when I was a dean at Rice um, from my different degrees. So I, I value the uh, uh, investment in an education that one should make. But I think that since 2008, uh, the fragility of the economy worldwide makes that investment harder and harder. And in the States, it, uh, the uh, mortgage, of, of a housing mortgage has a lower um, investment rate uh, than a, a school loan, as a, a lower um, funding, loan, funding rate. And, and so that's just insane to me. Um, part of my job is raising money to make education more accessible for all of our students, and one area is trying to raise money for international fellowships, um, and, and trying to also ensure that international students feel welcome when they come to the school. So. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yes. So we actually finished the first part to get to know our first female dean at GSD, and now we're going to go to more like you know, discussion on global disruption. So please welcome Kobe Vishai and Dr. Surakon. Topic, and I just want to let all of you kind of 
explain more in your perspective. So what is global disruption? Shall we start with Kun we shall we add everyone just one minute so we can have more to an aid. Okay. Um, in my opinion, um, it's more like uh, the disruptive global trends. And I classify it into three trends. First is urbanization. Well, these days there are more people living in the cities than the global area for the first time in human history, which means that there will be more and more problems for cities around the world, especially in developing countries. So it's a task of the urban designers and city planners to solve all these problems. The second trend is the populism. These days, you will see that more and more governments are geared towards to populism uh, to get elected. The US, for example, make a great, great again, trade war. And problems in European countries, you will see that these are the disruptions which are happening. And in some countries, especially in developing countries, there are more things like corruption. This is the ongoing disruption in many places and that pulls uh, many countries down instead of uh, moving forward. And I think many of us know that uh, in our country, that is the big problem. And there are many projects that uh, my association and uh, the Thai urban designers have been opposing uh, these days. The third trend is the technology. I think everyone knows about this digital technologies, uh, Internet of Things, um, or by uh, smartphones and many other things that uh, technology is changing uh, for the better or for the worse for uh, our days of today. Yeah. Yes. So maybe go to Dr. Surapong. Uh, what's your mean by global disruption and you are have you having a background of architecture and technology? What does that mean for you? Well, actually, I agree with Michelle. Exactly what he said. Um, and if I only have one minute to explain, but I, I think global disruption to me would be uh, a Donald Trump tweet. That's a real global disruption, and also a technological disruption. So that's very political. Uh, whatever he says impacts everyone. Uh, but as you can see, technological uh, disruptions, uh, especially during this period, it's pretty much about communication. Uh, you access information instantly, and you don't have much uh, time to disseminate or to validate some of these information. So you really, uh, this becomes a global issue, uh, especially in Thailand, uh, that uh, affects the well-being of our, our daily lives. Um, but also, in, in a local uh, sense, uh, Thai people use a lot of these resources for other purposes, and that changes our behavior. Uh, for instance, we use uh, uh, applications like uh, Line um, and uh, Grab. And a funny story is one of my students uh, in the second year, and this is very disruptive to me because being trained as a, a classical architect, uh, we really don't do things like this. They have all the time they, they, they can spend um, enjoying food and other things. And they, they spend little time uh, doing their work. And how they do that is very interesting. They would uh, do all their files in CAD, send these files to a, a laser uh, shop, and to go link their email, ask a aligned uh, operator to uh, purchase some materials in a store, and then deliver it to the laser shop, and then wait at the laser shop until the laser is cut, and then deliver it to her while she eats. So that's all done in two hours. And we've never actually done that in our lives, so this is very disruptive. Uh, and what that means is uh, they have less time uh, to uh, disseminate the information or to be very deep, uh, dive deeply into what they're actually designing. So they want to rush things and get things produced as soon as possible, and then focus on other things that are, are more their priorities. So I think this is uh, very disruptive, in a sense, as an educator. Yes. But uh, enough of those, because yes. some of our students are here. <laughs> 
So yes, this disruptive behavior of the young generation. And actually, I want to know, Sarah, what you think about the global disruption and what in your kind of global perspective that is the most urgent issue that we as a society need to adapt and change immediately. So I will, with politeness, uh, echo actually my two uh, predecessors here. I, and I think you were quite eloquent in naming the three uh, yes. forms of disruption that actually work together, I, I would argue. So I would, I would simply recast it slightly. Um, so I think that you explained it very well, but I would, I would uh, sort of give the same answer with a slightly different uh, lens, which is I, I agree that the issue right now is that the world is becoming more and more organized. And uh, part of really what got me interested in design in the first place was the fact that we uh, exist on this world with every person being different. So again, you know I have a twin brother. Right. That's pretty close, right? We've been together since we were quite small, um, and yet we're very different. And I, that fascinates me. And so what happens as we start to bring people closer and closer together, and more and more in differing, uh, bringing different people together in these global uh, urban megalopolises, really. And so I think that the fact that the world is becoming urbanized, and, and people are suddenly um, cheek to jowl with people that they aren't familiar with means that you have this rise of populism because you have a that, that we're, we're encountering right now a period that I hope doesn't last too long of a kind of reaction against that global change which is a permanent change an extraordinary change for our world I mean the fact that um, I'm here because of this jet plane that gets me here and I can spend time learning about a completely different culture is extraordinary to me uh, but, but really, that, that rise of populism comes out of an anxiety of what that globalization has wrought. Uh, and that's coupled with technology, meaning that people don't even, when they're walking down the street, don't realize that there are other human beings on the street. Right? They're only tethered to their little world. And through technology, they're trying to maintain their social network as a group of people who are like them. And so technology is, is really preventing them from living in the world that we have, which is bringing a lot of heterogeneous people in one place. And so that's, I think, the disruption is the fact that we're not yet over this and, and understanding how to live in this new world that we have, this new reality of a, a heterogeneous um, conglomerate, and, and learning to exploit that for its good. Yes, I really like how all of you see as kind of pro in the beginning, but it's actually it's like a con in terms of like how we live as a human. And it's actually try to get as close together as like technology, which is actually we are kind of dehumanizing ourselves with all this technology. So I'm wondering as the um, the approach of this and back to the design, designer, design practice and design education. How can we go with disruptive society? And as an educator, practitioner, how can we frame the new generation to really see and understand of this thing, like according to your students or your kids? And how would you, how would you teach them? Like, what's, what's the method to really cope with this? Well, uh, yes, I, I have children of my own, and uh, it's very hard for me to make them go to bed on time uh, because of these technologies and uh, cell phones that they have. Uh, I, I think uh, in education, what we try to do is we, we uh, develop a, a curriculum that uh, exposes students to uh, a lot of interactivity with people uh, and with a diverse group of uh, faculty members. Um, as Kunbisha mentioned that we have to have the new perspective in terms of doing this design for the new behavior of openness. So as you've seen all this development for 47 years, what would you be the topic that you think Thai society can move forward into with this urban design? Because it's moved so slow from a practice. Yes. Well, there's a saying that 
we talk about smart cities, is saying that all smart cities are not future cities, but all future cities will be digital cities. I think uh, we cannot deny that uh, all cities in the world in the future will be digital based. And um, from experience, and you asked about um, my past uh, experience of um, being a urban designer, which actually I did not really practice urban design in Thailand, since basically urban design and city planning are done by the uh, public sector because they have uh, their own departments and they uh, control all the cities uh, from, from the um, high office because as you know that uh, cities uh, is very economical importance to the country and uh, a lot of interest of the um, uh, private sectors uh, put a lot of emphasis on the um, land use, the zoning and in fact uh, our city planning for the country is already settled down up to this moment. So um, I got involved more into uh, the real estate development side. But at the same time, I try to uh, do this on the side, uh, practice on the, the sideline as uh, try to promote uh, the profession to the public. Because I can foresee that uh, these days uh, there are many institutions offering uh, urban design uh, programs and degrees and there are many graduates who uh, cannot find jobs or who have to do other things than uh, doing the urban design profession which is uh, uh, it's a sad story but anyway that's what's happening um, well looking at the uh, environment in Thailand I think uh, uh, although we have seen many cities are growing very fast. Bangkok now is looking uh, beautifully from uh, the air. You see the pictures of uh, Chao Phraya River taken from uh, the high up. It's just as beautiful as any other major cities, including uh, London or Paris. But once you come down to the ground, <laughs> it's totally different. Well, um, having said that, I think uh, uh, that is the task of urban design to uh, uh, help to uh, design the, 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 the cities in, in the country. Now, uh, the good thing is that at least the Ministry of Interior is commissioning uh, outside urban design firms to uh, do the design for many uh, major cities in the country. Like for example, Khon Kaen or, or uh, other big cities like uh, Mahasaratha they are commissioning uh, some urban design firms, although the work are not really ideal as uh, we would like to see it, but that is the trend that uh, at least uh, there are some movement in using the urban designers to do the planning and the design. So um, I would say that the trend is getting better, but to implement is more important because many designs end up in the shelves because uh, uh, they were done uh, beautifully but the politicians and the government officials of course yes. they would rather do on their own as you as you, you know it so yes. that is my experience from uh, uh, you know uh, involving in this profession yes i do agree with Kumishai. so much of time and resource is going into the paper but when it's implemented it's actually create more problems and i just feel that many planning department that government assigned is only just looking in the human development side but not in like the water, the landscape and many other issues that should be involved in. Yes, I think that's the most question. Yes? Sorry. So, okay. I, I, I think we kind of have to turn this around a little bit because it's getting a little bit dire. Right? <laughs> I mean, you're saying your students, they just, they outsource everything, they all they want to do is eat. You're, you're saying that students can't find jobs. Let me say, there's a, I, I do want to say this is an incredible moment, right? We have, uh, I think, a, a group of students who really do want to change the world. Uh, and we need to corral that idealism and recognize that these are incredibly smart kids who 
if we can teach them how to communicate, how to look carefully at things, how to communicate, how to talk to one another, and how to work uh, collaboratively, we're unleashing an unbelievable force. And so we're teaching them how to think and work visually and verbally at the same time, synthetically, working across disciplines. And these are people, it's true, they may not all get the jobs that they think they're gonna get when they come into a school, whether yours or, or ours. But when they go out, they can do so many extraordinary things. And I think that's actually what we have to, as a faculty, recognize, and also as an alumni group, looking at this next generation that's coming through, we have to recognize that it is going to be different for them. They are different than we were. They're frustrating sometimes, yes. Um, and we have to get them off their cell phone sometimes. But I actually think that, that we're hitting a, a moment where that's possible. And they are interested in questions of equity, questions of climate, questions of the future. They are the ones who face the most difficult future there is. And so, I, I mean, I, I understand the kind of cons dominant yes. uh, discussion, but I do think that we, we have to step back and recognize what an extraordinary, it's 2020, who knew that we were going to hit 2020? For me, that's a number that always was in the future. Right? <laughs> it's here now, uh, and I think that's an amazing moment for us to really uh, take advantage of. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So the more disruptive, the more human we have to become very grounded than ever. So thank you so much for the opinion, but now let's return into the audience. And any questions that you want to ask these three speakers? Or... <laughs> yes. About the issues of Thailand or internationally? Or... Yes. We'll be next. Yes. Uh, my name is Ankana. I'm a GSD alumni in this uh, in 2002. I would like to ask the follow-up question from uh, Dean Sarah said I would like to know more about the GSD plan because we talk about the global disruption, the equity and also the climate change. That uh, you said uh, of GSD students who want to change the world, want to do something. So what what things that GSD have or any branch or of uh, education that, that you have offered and also your future plan that you have for the, the Thank you. GSD with generation of students. Thank you. So, so I, I think that right now we're trying to offer as many opportunities to the students to essentially uh, take for, form their opinions and, and run with them. And so that, that comes in the form of the courses that they, they take and what we, our expectations that we put on them. But it also comes from, for example, we've just put out a call for the students to create their own journal that will help support financial aid. And we said, okay, you, you come to us with proposals for a journal and uh, you have to explain why it's a relevant approach to a journal, a system that then can be taken by future generations. So we want a journal that will be for the students that will, will last a while. Um, and so they have to explain why the system of the, the setup will work, why the approach is relevant, and what sort of topics they'll take on. So for us, it was sort of an experiment. We said, okay, we'll put out this call in December, when we got 17 proposals, I was surprised that we got that many. And they were extraordinary proposals that really sort of offered new formats that we wouldn't have thought of, and new directions for thinking of how they can offer a voice to their generation. And so I think it really is our responsibility to find different mechanisms like that. We have different fellowships, we have different independent study options for them over summers, over when they graduate. Um, and then helping them really find jobs. And so that's part of really what we try and do at the school is um, I think every, every opportunity we have to help them foster their own directions. Um, and I would say that's, that's sort of one way of, of helping corral and, and um, 
really incite that, the next generation. Um, we are also, as I think many of you know, um, uh, considering an addition to Gun Hall. Um, the school is a lot bigger than it used to be. We have expanded beyond Gun Hall to um, nine buildings in Cambridge um, and two buildings further on. So we actually have, this, the school has outgrown its clothes, as it were. Um, Gun Hall is also going to turn 50 years old in two years, and it, it, it needs a little bit of a facelift, to be honest. Um, it needs some help, and so um, part of what we want to do is, is uh, do a renovation for the building to improve it, to have our building reflect the values that we ask of our students in terms of climate change and environmentally secure. Um, but we also want to expand the building to create more spaces where they can have the kind of informal and formal conversations and exchanges that we're talking about why students need to learn how to communicate with one another. And so stay tuned for, for news of that, but um, the uh, renovation of the building is something that we really are working on right now. We're hoping to uh, launch in, in the next couple of years. Thank you. Um, could I, yes. So in terms of the interdisciplinary connect, is there something that Harvard is doing that is actually um, leaping in front of others or that's different from other universities that you think is worth mentioning? I mean, I think that the fact that we have the three departments is still a real strength of the school. The options presentations to me are an extraordinary array of these courses some of which, so there were 18 option studios in the, in the fall. And maybe I would say five or four were disciplinary focused, so were specific to a single discipline, a couple in landscape, a couple in, in architecture. All the rest were shared across students from any of the departments could take them. And I think that that, to me, remains the GSD's great strength, is uh, really seeing the option studios as a moment when students with these different disciplines come together. It's not easy. It doesn't always work seamlessly. Um, but I think that that, which is an ongoing interdisciplinary action, works very well. Additionally, the school has developed a program with the School of Engineering, the Master of Design Engineering, which is mildly successful, very interesting interdisciplinary collaboration with that school. We have collaborations with the School of Public Health. We're trying to develop more collaborations with the business school, and we have a collaboration with the college um, to create a major in the college, um, which never existed before, to have a, a concentration, as Harvard calls everything by a different name, right? So concentration um, for um, architectural design so um, those are, I think, some, some changes. Any more questions for Deans and Kun Wishai and Dr. Surpong? I'm actually really like your answer. I'm kind of questioning a bit about my faculty at Chile since we have multidisciplinary department as well. And did we mix enough or did we? while waiting for our questions. for me. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Are we mixed enough? Cut as I've been. <laughs> well, I, I can't say for all the other departments that it was um, strictly under the international program. But we, we do see research that is uh, across borders. Mm -hmm. And it uh, not only links within the faculty in different departments, but other faculties in, in other uh, schools, like uh, research related to health uh, design, which relates back to how you uh, design housings and residents that are very high rise and very compact. As, as rooms get smaller and smaller, the, the rate of isolation and the uh, stress level of people increases. That has to be measured in some way. So, uh, schools, uh, public health, School of Medicine also help with that. And so we, we try to combine uh, research that uh, takes into these kinds of data. So biometrics, uh, measuring blood pressure, uh, the heart rate, um, the temperature, and so on. You see how, how to reflect upon what you experience in, in the space. 
and if we can make things better uh, for for the increasing uh, density of the, the city. So this is a possibility in research that we do uh, amongst other disciplines in schools. Uh, within the, the faculty alone, um, I see small scale projects and, and collaborations mm -hmm. and exchanges. Uh, uh, but uh, I think as an international program, we, we try to have various topics. So <laughs> some of you relate to urban, some of you relate to landscape, some of you product design, and so on. That's how we think towards other programs as well. Thank you. Yes. Yes, more. Yes. I think that's the way of the future. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Yes, Kat. Why are we talking about um, disruption? Um, I'd like to know about idea about future that uh, maybe Jesse or uh, the other two thinking about like because at first in my opinion I think disruption is not that good it's like more like a um, negative thing but is this is some way that we can take advantage from it or do we think that this disruption is can drive that we moving forward to make something new. I, I, I think i like to know more vision from you guys. Okay. Um, well, disruption, as you said, that is more for the um, cons side, but they are close to uh, look at the uh, technology that is enabling us to have a better life, uh, especially in the future. Um, now uh, that the designers now have to think of how to reduce waste from uh, the design, uh, when they design the city, how to cut down the uh, carbon emissions. And also, uh, these new technologies like uh, the electrified vehicles, uh, or even the, the shared uh, um, uh, communication, uh, such as Uber or um, you know, Grab, things like that. That will be getting better too if uh, we do it correctly. But of course, there are cons that um, uh, the automation or robotics will really reduce the workforce, especially for the labor. The income gap now is getting wider and wider. In Thailand, especially, we can see that the rich, especially um, uh, as some uh, may know, that only a limited uh, uh, families control basically um, the major wealth of the country. And uh, how are we going to uh, tackle this problem? Uh, this is uh, things that the government has to plan. But I still think that uh, technology, especially uh, digital technology, will also uh, improve our lives uh, into the future, especially things like uh, disease control, uh, you don't now you, you don't see things like, like uh, the epidemic, like uh, in the old days the Spanish flu, things like that, or, or the plant. Um, in the book uh, of, of Duval, who wrote uh, Homo Sapien, and in, in his next book, Homo Deus, he said that there are three things that always stay with human beings from history. First is family, second is plant. Third is war. I think now uh, at least uh, life uh, is going to change of these three things that we have been suffering from the history. So look at the bright side, I think uh, technology will help and uh, we have to make sure that it is under control of our human beings today. Yes. I also have to say that, that disruption has actually been Part of our world from the beginning. Right? I mean, if you think of so the uh, trains, the railway system disrupted life. It actually forced people to adopt a standard system of time. That's a huge disruption for the world. Right? Uh, fascinating progress and a disruption to a way of life. Um, and if you look at any moment in history. The world has advanced through disruptions by being shaken out of complacency. And so we can look at disruption in, in, in positive and negative ways. And right now, I have to admit, the world, the disruptions are kind of piling up in a way that's pretty negative. 
but we do have to step back and, and realize that disruption is something that's been with us for since the beginning of time. Yes. I, I totally agree that uh, with disruptions, and I was actually asked to talk about the cause, but uh, there are so many opportunities out there that uh, could help uh, make our lives better. And uh, as a, a school, we try our best to, to make these small steps and introduce these uh, uh, global issues and uh, relevance to uh, global disruptions and how the students can actually uh, put this into the designs. So for example, we, we have this uh, studio uh, to re revamp an existing building facade and students came up with an idea of using the facade It's not just a, a second skin, but to use the skin uh, as a filtering system for PM2.5. So uh, this could be placed in, uh, in high traffic areas, so the facade acts as a, a double skin that uh, filters uh, the air and puts back in, in clean air to the society. And that's something that uh, is not possible without these kinds of technological disruptions. And with the communications, so we have to talk about to uh, students in uh, electrical engineering, computer science, uh, and so on. So that is that kind of disruption, small steps. So. Yes, we have one, one, more. one more for the last brief So perhaps to touch back on the issue of uh, interdisciplinary um, connections in, in education, um, but before Dean uh, uh, mentioned about uh, one of the core reasons for conservatorism, for example in housing design, realizing the fact that, as you were saying, uh, being primarily driven by the private sector, um, that falls back on, on previous solutions that are kind of more secure for the, for the business side. No? And this, I think, is something extremely uh, visible in a city like Bangkok that, in that sense, is, uh, is extremely driven by the private sector in the, in the housing experimentation. No? So, how do schools uh, could uh, actually, schools of design, could promote much more integration with the business and economic uh, research because perhaps I feel that is one of the sides that we are used to interact with the least uh, in terms of design education, in terms of design studios. I, I wonder, for example, if one of those option studios that you mentioned uh, has an interdisciplinary approach, is that any of those actually having business experts inside? That would Yes. An interesting yeah, thank you. I, th I think that's a, a great question. I, I think that we're we're at a moment where uh, being radical or critical in design practices doesn't mean turning your back on uh, business. Um, and I think that that's actually an interesting moment as opposed to sort of. But if you think of sort of architectural theory, grew up post 68 and really was wed to Marxist theories, which doesn't make it terribly business friendly. So um, I think that right now we're at an interesting moment where design theory is not necessarily business friendly in the sense of wanting to make it a quick buck, but is um, maybe more interested in having an impact on the world as it exists outside today. And I think that when that's combined with the challenges of contemporary business world, so think seven years ago, we all thought Airbnb and Uber, or what's the version of Uber here, yeah. Grab, we all thought that that was liberating young people to have jobs that allow them to be nimble and really terrific and they don't have to be tied down to something. Now, seven years later, five years later even, we're recognizing the challenges of those systems in terms of they actually don't necessarily empower the people who occupy those jobs. 
And so I think we're in a really interesting moment where the economy is not as easy, the new economy isn't as easy or as sort of glowing as we thought it was, but I think that we might be approaching it with more realistic opportunities. Um, and so the Master of Design Engineering, I think, is a great example of uh, an area at the school that's taking on real issues. They take on a different issue each year, so health systems, waste systems, food systems. And they approach it um, uh, working with business, but also pushing business, pushing industry, um, while also learning from industry. And I think it's a good model for the rest of the school, actually. So it's a, it's a moment of transition for educational systems. I think we, we, can, we can both push the, the real world, as one says, uh, but also be more respectful of, of learning from it. Yes. Commissioner Pippen, do you have anything to add on this answer? No? Okay. So, very last one. I would like to know one word from GSD experience that still hold true to you throughout your practice until today. <laughs> one word, just one. Who? Yes. Learn. Learn. Yes. I think it's very important for anyone, uh, especially uh, from GSD. Uh, we can always learn things. And now with the uh, digital technology, learning is even more important than, than, than before. And uh, learning will uh, uh, make us up to date and uh, uh, be more resilient and also be more optimistic uh, uh, on the uh, future world. So uh, I think learning is something that uh, everybody should uh, have that in mind all the time. Thank you, Akun Mishai. Very refreshing to, to have this word from those who practice for seven, 47 years. <laughs>
These meals are sustainably prepared and served. You can notice that we have a very small amount of waste. So for those uh, who RSVP in advance, uh, you are eligible for, for a light meal. For those who just walk in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we have a limited amount of food, so that's those who, uh, who sign up uh, first, uh, take there. But you can, you can just stick around and see if there's any left. You can use food waste, so make sure that uh, none of us gets waste. Uh, for today, uh, the GSA in Heart of Thailand, thank you so much to the Faculty of Architecture at Long Island University, to the deans, the general staff, to everyone involved in the preparation of this event. Thank you to the inviting for coming all the way here to Bangkok. Uh, have a pleasant journey uh, to Tokyo, to Japan, uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.